Good morning. Thank you so much. It's um, nice to be back here. I haven't been in this building, I think, for about 25 years, so it's nice to come back. Um, I have to say thank you, uh, Alan, who is still there, um, for mentioning Tihila, because that is going to be the subject of my um, talk today. Um, such a uh, a renowned and canonical story in um, the Israeli experience, so much so that to write or speak about Agnon's Tehillah at this stage of Hebrew literary history is kind of like walking into a room where two opposing groups are having a very vociferous, loud argument um, and trying to get in a word edgewise. <laughs> Uh, what I'm referring here is to the long-standing debate between those like Baruch Kurzweil or Eli Schweid and more recently Hillel Weiss and uh, Ruth Ben Pinchas who read the character of Tehillah as an apotheosis of faith, right? A woman who manages by dint of her extraordinary piety and forbearance to transcend her many sorrows and to die at an extraordinary old age that she herself selects, um, thereby personifying and embodying the virtues of traditional piety um, of, of old world Jerusalem as opposed, okay, so that's one side of the argument. The other side of the argument are those um, most famously like Amos Oz and people who have followed him who, who argue that Tehillah is a story of a once pious woman whose encounter with the modern day narrator, Sofer, author, uh, provokes her to reevaluate her life at the end and who dies in a condition of madness, anger, and skepticism. Now, there couldn't be two readings that are more polar or opposite than those. And um, I think all of us can agree that the best way to read Agnon is not on one of those two poles, but rather as somehow embodying both. That Agnon, it, uh, our best and fullest and most interesting reading of Agnon, is something that's lodged not on either end of the spectrum, but that embodies a combination of the two. And here I'll, I'll actually lean on Agnon and a statement that he himself made, knowing full well that uh, ev everything Agnon said, one has to take with a certain grain of salt, but I love this quotation. This is a, a quote that comes from an address that he made upon receiving the Israel Prize in 1954. So this is four years after the publication of Tehillah. And Agnon was responding to the whole question of whether or not there was a modern aspect to him, which we all know, of course, irrefutably there was. This is what he said. I'm, I don't walk after the manner of the modernists. I'm not scrubbed clean of any trace of modernism. Rodabi, sicha. So, he, and I mean, there's a play here at every turn. Even the use of, of roda as a way of saying rule is playing on the same language, right? So, Agnon is saying, take a look at me and understand that I'm a combination of a number of things. Um, what I would like to, to do today, um, take the prerogative here, in this crowded field of Tehillah studies, to bring, I think, a, a, a side that no one has much thought about or looked at closely. Um, and that's specifically to look at the way in which Agnon's uh, famous story from 1950 might have been inspired by an earlier story by his contemporary and friend, the Hebrew woman writer Dvora Baron. Here, I am not coming up um, with this idea whole cloth all by myself. There was a teaser given by Nurit Govrin in her book um, that collected ba um, Baron's early stories in which she suggested that this was a possibility. And so I went off in trail of this, this uh, potential connection. Um, what I, um, why even bring these stories together? The story that I'm thinking of is um, Baron's Hasaf the Henya, which was published in 1909 in Hebrew and then 1910 in a Yiddish version. Um, so this, um, the story includes a number of elements, a number of striking elements that are very similar to Agnon's story. And it's coming out just at a time when Agnon and Baron are actually getting to know one another. So what is Hasaf the Henya? 
Hasaf Ta'aniyah is a story about, well, you know what, we'll get, we'll get to that in, in one moment. We'll get to that in one moment. Here I want to actually um, set up first the connection between Agnon and Baron. Um, and I, I want to begin with a, a teaser that comes from a story of Agnon's himself, where he is registering himself historically the sea change of the emergence of Hebrew women's writing. This, um, the quotation that I brought for you is from his famous story, Agadatha Sofer from 1919, in which, um, this is just a passing fleeting reference in Agadatha Sofer, where um, a man comes to visit the protagonist of the story, Rafaela Sofer, and says, you wouldn't believe what's happening out there in the world. I've actually um, witnessed with my own eyes a kind of like Bet Haroshet of, of Safrut. Um, oh, you know what? There's a shibush here. Um, okay. Pardon the pun. I've seen a number of men sitting together creating tefillin and mezuzot, and not just that. Lord, Ella, shemati omrim etel almoni afilu naarot yoshvot vikotvot. So he raises the possibility that there might be women sofrot. And of course here, early on in the story, that reference is not simply to the possibility, the far-flung, far-fetched possibility that women were um, writing to Filunu Mezuzot, but this is registering the emergence of a, a secular uh, Hebrew writing or the, the fabrika ut perhaps of journalism and prose writing and that women are taking part in that too. Now by the time, by 1919, Agnon himself was well acquainted with this phenomenon of women um, writing in the, in the Hebrew language. Uh, the preeminent example that I'm bringing here is of Dvorah Baron, whose dates are 1887 to 1956, who Agnon knew very well. Agnon himself comes to Palestine in 1908. Baron comes in 1910. They settle in the same neighborhood. She quickly becomes a staff member of Hapoel Atzair, which I brought a picture of from a, like a contemporary um, issue of Hapoel Atzair. She ends up marrying Yosef Aronovich, who is the editor of Hapoel Atzair, and Agnon, some of Agnon's earliest stories from that period are published in Hapoel Atzair. So Baron, who is the literary editor, is in effect his editor. Some of her stories, not Hasaf Tahenia, which comes out in, um, in Ha'olam, in the diaspora, but some of her stories are coming out at the exact same time. We know that they're reading each other, they're visiting one another. We know that when Agnon left Palestine in 1912, he gave her his curtains. <laughs> um, there was an intimate connection. We, we have letters in the archives between the two of them um, in which Agnon congratulates Bar Baron for the publication of her stories. We have um, evidence in, in her archives of um, memoiristic accounts of their visits with, with one another late into, into her life. She ends up dying in 1956. Um, this is the story in question that um, I want to talk about, Hasafta uh, Henya, which came out in Ha'olam, the journal of the, of the Histadrut HaTzionit. Um, Hasafta Henya, like Tihila, this is where we're going to roll out the very many similarities between these stories. Um, Agnon, uh, is the story of an exceptionally righteous woman from an Eastern European village who also, like Tihila, reputedly has a background of tremendous wealth um, and children. In the case of both of them, the protagonist ends, um, the, the story ends with the death of the protagonist at her appointed time. Each of them chooses the time of their death um, as if that is something that we can actually do in life name the time and outside of committing suicide, right? Um, both of these stories, Hasaf Tehenya um, being the earlier one, um, both of these stories evoke folk traditions of old world Jewish women's piety, but um, I want to call attention because perhaps this can help us interpret Tehila in interesting ways. Um, both Hasaf Tehenya includes some really surprising counter-traditional elements that you wouldn't expect to be in such a story. Um, and I, I'd like to su get, suggest, in, um, speculate, just, just uh, offer a conjecture that um, Agnon may very well have been inspired and imported aspects of this story 
uh, about Safta Hennia, and specifically this notion of the grandmother as a kind of metonym or personification for the town, in Baron's case, as a metonym or personification of the shtetl, that he may have used this and um, transformed it into a personification of the old city of Jerusalem. Um, perhaps coming from the same notion that Alan was suggesting, that, th that there was some insufficiency in the old world model that needed to be imported to Eretz Yisrael and updated and perhaps even modernized in certain ways. Okay. few things that I need to say specifically about the background of, this, of the stories that Hasaf Tehenia is a part of. This story comes out at a time between 1908 and 1910 um, when Baron is busy writing a number of stories that are specifically and vociferously um, arguing for greater women's participation in ritual. Um, they're exposing the mistreatment of women's texts. I'm here referring to a story of hers called Gniza. Uh, there's another story called uh, Kaddisha, in which it, she argues for women being able to recite Kaddish. Um, so that Safta Enya is coming from this kind of sidra of stories that, that have a particular argument. And it's hard if we imagine there being an interlay or some sort of background of Baron's story in Tehillah, not to see those aspects kind of shimmering up um, from the background. Okay, now in terms of um, Tehillah itself registering some of these issues, I'm just pointing to um, the way in which not just Agadat HaSofer registers the presence, the new found presence of women in Hebrew literary history, but Tehillah itself has a moment. Um, here I'm referring to that moment before Tehillah um, asks the Sofer to write her letter to Shraga. Um, she asks him specifically not to use his fountain pen, but to use a quill. It has to be written on this Niyar Kesar, which is a kind of elevated aristocratic paper, and um, says, "Okay, tole ta nuta ut follow ta bidio uktov. Ani omar lcha biidit vata tichtov lishon akodesh." Now, I I'm going to tell you in Yiddish, and you translate it into Hebrew. Shemati shel melamdim et banot the ber velichtov lishon akodesh, beloshen kodesh. Roa ata roa ata bni hakadosh baruchu. So Tehillah herself is registering this shift that there are women actually that could write the, um, the, the letter themselves in Hebrew. And she says, which I do not believe in with, an, with any shemets of irony, <laughs> she says that in every generation God makes the world better. Okay, when I was a child, that, that wasn't the way that things were done. And the question that I have as I read this is whether or not there is some sort of indication at this moment in Tehillah's story, an awareness later in her life, that had it been different, that had she have been able to, to, to get that kind of education where she herself would be capable of writing in Hebrew, maybe some of the things that happened to her in her life might not have happened. Maybe the arranged marriage that she is subjected to, that the second arranged marriage might not have come to pass. Maybe she herself would have educated her daughter who comes to become an apostate differently. Um, it, you know, at the very least, the story seems to indicate that Shraga, her intended, whom she's supposed to marry, but, she, but doesn't, whose name means enlightenment or, in, or the light, that in some sense, in that marriage having been broken off summarily by her father on a, a, a kind of suspicion of, of his Hasidism, that that itself was some kind of robbing of the light for Tehillah. Okay, so now to establish more of the connections between these two stories, um, and they are kind of macro and micro. Um, one story is called Safta Henya, the other is called Tila. Henya is a derivative, for at least from all, everything that I've seen, of Chen Ya. Um, might be 
you know, might be a kind of hint or uh, to trina, to the idea of, of a Yiddish women's prayer, as opposed to, to tehillah, which is connected to tehillim, being a, uh, a biblical Hebrew prayer, okay? Add to this that Agnon's tehillah from the get-go, from the very first paragraph, is presented as chinanit, okay? So in an adjective that links her to that. Both women are seen throughout their stories saying, davening all the time, saying trinas as well as saying um, tihilim. Um, we are introduced to Safta Henya carrying this kankan nechoshet, this copper vessel. We're, introdu we're introduced to tihila carrying this pachmayim, also a vessel. Um, they are, both engage in similar practices, constant practices of chased, uh, almost all hyperbolic levels of of kindness and chesed, taking care of the sick, uh, taking care of orphans, giving out ca candies to everyone, all kinds of lovely activities. Um, they're also both, as I said earlier, seen as appointing their time of death. And in, in the story of Saftahenia, there's a crisis at the end where the Rav is sick and she announces, I have 70 years in, in my life, um, I'm gonna donate five of them to the Rav that decides that she's going to die, um, and at that moment uh, engages in an important act. I'll tell you in a second about it. A few more things. If you recall uh, Tihila, it's said over and over about her that she's um, preternaturally youthful despite her extraordinary, her zikna mufleged, right? She um, has the eyes, the eyes of a young girl. Uh, oh, well, excuse me, Tihila, that she has this rizut of alamot. Similarly, Henya is described as having the eyes of a young girl. Both of the stories, obviously, if I had more time, I'd lingo over this. I'm trying to be mindful of our structures here. Both of these stories include a conspicuous and a kind of proliferated use of this verb, um, akav, which um, it appears in a number of interesting junctures suggesting a kind of delay or, or, or a lingering over the act of mitzvot as if to transcend the regular r round of time, to make time stretch for the sake of their chesed. Both of the stories include a number of references to um, tovim and tovot um, in Baron Saftahenia. Shishtei eneha hatovot melatfot Ed kol panim, that she, her, her good eyes were caressing everyone. Agnon has a similar phraseology. This is at the end of Tehillah when she's surveying everything around her as she's approaching her death. Now, when I see this repetition of tov, tovim, tovot, um, I can't help but consider what might be a kind of folkloric background to both of these stories from the folkloric Im image, um, I mean historical, but transformed into a folkloric image of Sara Bastuvin, the 18th century author of, of Trinus. I'm just catching up here. Um, who is a figure who appears, um, we know of her because of her, her several important trinas. Um, we know of her further in Yiddish literature from Mendele, from Shalom Yaakov Abramovich Sviknol autobiography, Shloimer Reb Chaims, where he has a reference to Sarah Bastuvim and her trina for Knedlach Legen, for the laying of wicks and making candles on Yom Kippur, which is a ritual that specific, specifically appears in Baron's Hasafta Henya as one of the ways in which um, Tanya intercedes on behalf of a woman who's um, struggling in childbirth and goes to the cemetery and lays down wicks and appeals to the merit of the ancestors in order to, to save this woman in childbirth. Um, we also know of Sarah Bastuvim from uh, a famous um, parrot story, Der Zivig oder Sarah Bastuvim, which is about a kind of fairy godmother figure. We don't have much of this in Jewish literature. Eliyahu Navi often serves for us as our fairy godmother. Um, but we've got this kind of singular appearance of Sarah Bastuvim as a kindly uh, grandmother type figure. In this story, she flits back and forth, arranging matches for those who are specifically Pantelius about reciting her trinas. Um, and so there's a possibility, I'm wondering, about the way in which both of these stories um, take up this uh, fairy 
godmother-like figure. Um, I, I think that you will all agree that in some sense, Agnon's Tihila evokes some of the imagery or feel of female folk practices. There are certainly references to visiting um, Kever Recheli Menu. Um, one might even go so far as to argue that the entire story is a kind of metaphorical laying of the wicks on the grave of Tila so as to absorb her merit and to kind of preserve something of what it was about Tihila that, that ought to be inspirational and ought to continue to inspire uh, the life in Israel at that time. Um, I'll say one thing further, acknowledging that I'm, that I, I'm looking for these <laughs> references. There is a moment in, um, in, in Tehillah's recounting of her own life story her, with Shraga, where she imagines, she, she doesn't imagine, where she recalls her mother being mitchanenet, oh, that's not down here. Uh, being mitchanenet lifne abba lefayes et shraga, the mother is begging her father to say sorry to shraga on account of the the shidduch having being broken up. And the use of mitchanenet there is pleading, but because it's borrowing from the same um, verb and language of trinas, one argues whether this is on some level. Uh, um, an allusion to that tradition or to the kind of non-mainstream spirituality that uh, Tehillah's father has completely rejected in, uh, for the sake of preserving a kind of purity in, in the family's practices. And that Tehillah herself bears the consequences of his coming down on everything that is non-mainstream in spiritual practice. Okay. So uh, what I've shown so far is that these stories seem to have a connection with one another, that they seem to draw or gesture in, the dis in this direction of the Trinus tradition. They seem to evoke a kind of what might be a miraculous fairy godmother tradition. And, and yet I want, I'm trying to suggest that the story is mixed and that there are some indications that Agnon's not trying to use this material straight or to advocate that Tihila is a whole cloth, simple uh, carry over of that tradition, but that something might be getting a little bit subverted. And here I, I'm just calling attention to um, an, an important passage. This also comes right at the beginning when the Sofer is being asked to write the letter for Tihila. And he's, tr he's trying to put together, piece together the narrative from all of the bits and pieces that he's heard about Tihila's life. And he says, um, he's quoting Tihila as well as the things that he's heard about her. Okay, here, borrowing again from the tovim word. Things weren't so good. It's not that it ended happily ever after for her. She has this aspect of joy on the outside, but there's so much pain on the inside. And so I, I'd like to suggest that there's something of a lot of, you know, Sarah, lot of him, um, underlay to this story. Okay, so just getting you up to speed here. Ideally, we both have read, we've read Tila, we've read Saftahenia together, and then we talk about it. I have to get you all quickly caught up. Um, in the, you, you're all, those of you who are familiar with Tehillah know that it includes this origin tale. Um, what we, um, in the writing of the letter is preceded by, by Tehillah going through what had happened to her. To her. Safta Henya also includes origin tale aspects. In fact, um, different versions. Everyone's trying to figure out how this woman came to, to the condition that she's in. Um, and so they spin <laughs> out tales. According to one origin tale, she had um, a husband and a child. Her husband dies. She uh, tragically lays her child in, in her bed, goes to sleep, and ends up lying on her child and smothering the child to death. Um, as a result of this, she's a, she had been a wealthy woman. She gives away kind of an expiation, all of her money, and then goes out into the world to do chesed all the time. 
That's one version. The second origin tale is the one that's much more disturbing, and I would argue is the one that's argued against by the end of the story. According to the second origin tale, she is a woman who had seven sons. Given that her name is Henya, it's a little, you know, <laughs> closed, you know. So she suddenly becomes a version of Maccabees II, where she has seven sons and that tragically dies. So what happens? She has seven sons. She works day and night for her seven sons and her husband, who learn all day in the Beit Midrash. And the one pleasure that she gives herself is at night, she creeps into the Beit Midrash to listen in on them as they learn. And apparently, according to this origin tale, God did not look kindly at, um, upon that act, sent a fire from heaven like the fire from Sefer Vayikra on Nadav and Avihu, as if it's an Eish Zara, and consumes the Beit Midrash with all of her family. And she, as such an exemplary pious woman, never complains, gives away all of her money, and goes off to do chesed in the world. Now, if that really is the story, and she had accepted that notion of the story, um, the ending is completely impossible. Because what happens at the end of this story? Saftahenya had come to this town, becomes a fixture in, in the town, um, uh, and not just a fixture, a kind of a providential principle. Everyone looks to her as to be the guardian of this town, almost more than God, God's self. They look to her um, at, and they, to intercede for them. And um, angels flutter overhead on account of her. That, that's how it, uh, she is described. But this thing happens where the rabbi gets sick. She decides to donate her last five years for the sake of the Rav. And as she's about to die, announces that she's going to do a hachnasat sefer Torah in the community. I tried to get a picture of hachnasat sefer Torah. Now, there's no way to find a picture that actually represents what happens in this story. She announces that she's giving a Torah to the community. Um, and she herself carries the Torah under the chuppah into the Beit Midrash, at which point she invites the entire community to dance with her on the bima, including all of the poor and marginal figures in town. Okay, now if this is a woman who has accepted the notion that her encroaching on the male space of Torah study was so heinous a crime that it was, she was deserving of, the, of her whole entire family being consumed in flames, one would expect her to kind of stay away from that realm of Torah study afterwards. But dafka lehefech, she becomes this providential principal and she pres presides over this spiritual moment which didn't exist <laughs> in that world that she lived in. The completely male picture that we have here to the left indicates there's no picture that you can find of a hafnasat sefer Torah in a, in, a, in a from Eastern European context that would include a woman being at the center of, of, of a mixed group dancing with the Torah. Um, I, those of you who are looking at the quotation from the story will note the way in which she's also presented as um, a kind of David Amelech figure, right? Okay, what I want to suggest is that Agnon was aware of all of these patterns in this story and that there is this underlay or import of this narrative which affects potentially our view of Tihila as just a straightforward and uncomplicated uh, figure of hachna'a, of submission to the way things have always been. Um, I want to suggest that in the same way that Saftahenia commissions this Torah to be written as her kind of swan song, that uh, Tihila commissions the writing of a kind of Torah, the Torah of her life, which she insists um, has to be written by a sofer in Be'otiyot Shel Sidur o Be'otiyot HaTorah, Kiv Now we know that this is not exactly a conventional sofer, right? So she's making a conscious choice for this to Torah to be written in this modernist casing, shall we say? Okay, uh, all this, and this is something that we can um, spend hours on debating, um, all this comes against the backdrop of, the, of these slight intimations of doubt on Tehillah's part 
um, or, or, or simmering rage about what she has gone through and whether she indeed should submit or take responsibility for something that wasn't her, do her doing anyway. And this is the famous moment that uh, Amos Oz seizes upon, perhaps overmuch when he insists that um, Tihila ends actually with madness and rage. I wouldn't go that far, but there's something that we have to reckon with. Um, here I just translated the one moment um, where Tihila, as she's about to recite her story, says all of her, um, it's written of her, all of her calmness had disappeared and instead her face donned an aspect of grief and rage. How am I doing time-wise? Is that good? I'm okay. Okay, so why is the... Not too much. Not, not too much, okay. What's significant, of course, about Tihila is Tihila is not just Tihila. From the very beginning of the story, Tihila is presented as something larger than herself, as a, a stand-in for Yerushalayim itself, uh, for, or, for a particular vision of old Yerushalayim. Um, and so when we look at, um, at the, her personality and her story, we're also trying to figure out what the role of, um, of old Yerushalayim should be in the going forward of, of, of the culture. Um, this is just the most face, famous passage that's brought to show the way in which Yerushalayim and Tehillah as a personality are elided together. The narrator is referring Tehillah to Tehillah ostensibly, and yet he seems also at the same time to be referring to Yerushalayim. Ad shelo yatsati Yerushalayim lo hikarti ota. Who is the ota? Is it Yerushalayim or is it Tehillah? Mishchazarti Yerushalayim hikarti ota. Right, so we're we're presented uh, from the very beginning with the possibility that Tihila is, is more than herself. Um, what this is further complicated by the fact that Tihila is consistently juxtaposed with another widowed Rabbanit figure in the story, who is also elided <laughs> with old Yerushalayim, and that's the sickly Rabbanit. That, um, that the narrator visits, who's described as a zekena mevuhelet u'cheusa. Eni mitkaven lagid shivcha shel achat mitoch gnuta shel chaverta kol sheken l'saper ma'ase ha'ir v'yoshveha. After um, the narrator introduces this um, sickly cantankerous rabbanit, he attempts to say, I don't mean you know, to, to make one look bad at the expense of the other, and I don't mean to talk about all of Yerushalayim or the whole country, and yet we, very, we know very clearly that he is interested in bringing these two together and perhaps to see them as not even as separate people, but as separate uh, representations of Yerushalayim. It's vaunted, hallowed, righteous, distinguished side and its decrepit, um, angry, um, waning side at the same time. So I brought a picture that is meant to show that idea. Okay, here I'm, I'm going to try and um, extend the, the connection even further. I've, I, up until now, I've been looking at Tihila and um, <coughs> and Saha Safahenya as stories that might have connections with, with one another, that might have a, a kind of shared origin. Um, here, I'm going out on a limb, and I'm willing to take a beating on this if this seems uh, too much of a stretch, um, to suggest that it may not only be um, the characters in the story or the, the, the stories that are linked, but Agnon's own experience of Devora Baron that might also have fed some of his um, experiences or the way in which he depicts both the Rabbanit and Tihila. Um, those of you who are familiar with the story of Dvorah Baron, after she left her editorship of Hapoel Hatzair um, in 1923, she very famously and mysteriously became a recluse for the rest of her life and never left her apartment and suffered from some sort of mysterious illness that people um, were not able in, in, in entirely to get to the bottom of. Um, and so people would come and visit her <laughs> in the manner th that um, Agnon's narrator, in a sense, comes to visit the, the old Rabbanit. Um, and there are um, reminiscences of visiting 
Dvara, Dvara Baron that I found in um, the collection of reminiscences that her daughter uh, Tsipora Aronovich edited that include descriptions that are strikingly similar on the one hand to the old Rabbanit and what she was like, and on the other hand to the appearance of Tehila's apartment at the end of the story. So um, in, in this particular reminiscence, uh, this friend, uh, someone who knew Dvora Baron from the old days in the old country, um, remarks on how much Baron loved the shtetl of her youth and how she also did not mince words about the things that she hated and that she was capable of great intense anger and hatred. And so you see this kind of carping quality of the Rabbanit uh, and a kind of echo in, um, or, or the two of them uh, playing off of one another. Similarly, this is a description, I put them next to one another, a description of Yochanan Tversky's a visiting of Dvora Baron in her house, describing it, describing the shift in atmosphere that occurred when you would enter into her apartment as ki'ilu hakol omed kan bitfilat amida. That entering into her apartment was like entering into, some, into the midst of a, a tfilah, and this is a famous passage from Tila. Minorat Nechoshet, I told you that Safta and Henia began with um, her carrying a, a kankan Nechoshet. Here, Nechoshet, 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 these uh, temple-like vessels in her apartment. Minorat Nechoshet, Kalal, Natlash al Nechoshet, Minorat Nechoshet, Shal Kama Kanim, Shinishtal Shalam in Etikra, Ulamata, Vechena Shulchan, Shayumun Achimalea, Sidur Vechumash, Vod Sefer, Hishru al Acheder, Me'en Chino. Okay, so one last point. I think I've tried to bring together these two stories. One, which figures Tehila, uh, uh, Henya as a kind of metonym or a personification of everything that's holy of the shtetl. Um, I've also tried to, you know, perhaps bring together Agnon's history with Dvora Baron. I need to note um, what happens at the end of Asaf Tehenya that complicates matters, and, and, and that will allow us to look at the ending of Tihila. I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting there, very close. So at the end of Asaf Tehenya, um, we've got this uh, luminous spiritual high point of the Hachnasat Sefer Torah, at which point she dies. And the people come back from the, the cemetery with this pallor and downcast look, which is likened to their pale like cloth. So, white like cloth, as in the parchment of a Sefer Torah. And looming in the distance is the Catholic Church and the wailing of dogs. What's clear from the end of the Hasaftahenia is a great respect for the piety and the beauty of that life but a fear that it's run without kind of some sort of miraculous intercession, that community is no longer viable. <laughs> this um, continues very much on the argument that Agnon seems to be making in, in Ir Um Lo'ah. And the fact that this story was published just as Baron herself is <coughs> leaving the old world and committing herself to Zionism is suggesting that she herself is while respecting that matrix is insisting that it's, it's no longer viable because all that's left is a kind of dead cluff that can't sustain anyone anymore in the absence of this actual um, fairy godmother-like figure. Um, what happens at the end of Tihila? Uh, we similarly have a tragic death of this wonderful figure um, and Agnon, the narrator, finding out about it. Um, and what I'd like to suggest is that, is that Agnon, in a sense, is importing, importing this image of Tila into his story, but instead of it being a Henya or the, the grandmother figure being killed off and presented as no longer viable, he somehow trying to insist that, that she can live on in some way. Now, where am I deriving <laughs> this sense that Agnon wants to um, both call attention to what is not viable about the old world tradition, but also insist that it live on? Here, I'm pointing to what seemed to be 
conspicuous references at the end of the story of, uh, of Tila to the story of the death of Eliyahu Navi in Sefer Malachim. Right, that in every turn, she tries to separate from the narrator, and the narrator says, no, I'm going to stick with you. No, I'm, I'm going to my place. No, I'm going to stick with you. I'm going to my, right? And we know from Malachim that that is what enables Elisha to uh, be there for the kind of transfer of prophetic power, and for then uh, the tradition of Eliyahu Anavi as a harbinger of Messiah to, to, to kind of live on in, in our folk memory. So. What I am wanting to sec suggest here is that um, this is Agnon's way of trying to combine a reverence for the old, but also call attention to uh, the need for certain parts of that old way to be modified or buried or put in a geniza out of respect for the sake of, uh, of, of some future uh, re regeneration. And I'll, I'll add just one last point because um, I, I want to get in the whole question of, of he, uh, feminine personifications of the city and the land, which, which is such a long-standing tradition um, in, in biblical literature and in, and in our tradition. Uh, where, what sorts of feminine personifications of the land do we typically see in biblical literature? Right? What does Yerushalayim um, typically look like? Um, she's either Batsion, imagined as a young vibrant or perhaps overly haughty woman, but more typically she's spoiled, wanton, immodest, sinning, dis despoiled, ruined, humbled, punished, uh, you know, once harlot. Uh, and it, it, if we have here a kind of countervailing per, um, personification of Tehillah as a uh, Yerushalayim, a righteous grandmother, we suddenly have a very different image. We have uh, a figure of agency, of dignity, of valiance, who in, in the modern sense has the, the insight to recognize the flaws of the past, including the practice of arranged marriage, the fanning of baseless hatred, the secondary status of women, and she also has the good sense and perspicacity to enlist the offices of a modern sofer, a modern writer, to write the Torah of her life in such a way as to carry the past forward, but also to bring to it um, ever new interpretations and echoes, perhaps those of uh, Devorah Baron, an important path-breaking woman writer. Thank you very much. The third speaker is Rav Shalom Karmi, Professor Shalom Karmi.